Uh, at Google, um, and my job is really to work with people making Android apps to help them make the best possible app. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Android today. I've been given 20 minutes, which is pretty lean to talk about a subject which I could wax lyrical about all day long. So um, I've decided to condense that down to talking about um, thinking outside on two, two topics. Um, which I think are really key to making an amazing mobile experience, making an awesome Android application. Uh, so this is two things which I think um, people aren't thinking about enough or not really kind of understanding um, that if you bear in mind when you're designing and building your application, you can build an awesome Android application that's going to be uh, take you to the next level and go crazy. So I'm going to focus on thinking outside the screen and thinking outside the app, and I'll kind of take you through what that means. So starting um, thinking about screens. When people um, look at the Android landscape or the devices out there, they sometimes have this kind of like, whoa, moment. Like, there's all these different devices. You might have seen, um, you know, scary charts saying that there's all these different um, resolutions. So people seem to tend to latch on to resolution. They understand this number. This is, you know, how many pixels there are on a screen. But what I'm going to encourage you to do is to throw that number away and just don't think about it at all. And instead, think about size and density. So if you think about a screen, um, if you consider the size, like the physical size, this is a 5-inch screen, this is a 7-inch screen, and density, um, then you can actually forget about resolution. All the same information that resolution conveys can be thought about in these two orthogonal kind of things. And if you do that, then Android gives you really, really powerful tools uh, to dealing with that. The first thing is this little guy called the dip. This is um, what we call a density-independent pixel. It's a way of abstracting away the density of the screen. What it is, as, a, as the line there says, it's a unit of measure that keeps things the, physical, the same physical size across different density screens. So what that means is if I have this tablet on the left, which is like what we call a medium density device, and I size an element to be 200 dips, say, it's going to be, you know, perhaps use 200 physical pixels to show that. And on a much higher density device, what we call like an extra high density device, it might actually use 400 physical pixels to show the same thing. But as you see, they'll be the same size. So the power of this is you forget about density. You can just forget about it and size stuff saying, I need this to be this big. I need this to be you know, this much room to show an image or this much room to show a block of text. Um, and you can you know, abstract away from it. Uh, another example of why this is um, powerful is if you have these two um, tablets. So on the left is like a, you know, a Zoom that came out a couple of years ago, which had this resolution of 1280 by 800. And then a year later, another tablet came out with this crazy, much bigger resolution. And you might think, oh, crap, how's my app going to work or scale onto this screen? But if you sized everything in these dip units, uh, it actually works out, because this one's a much higher density. They have exactly the same resolution in dips. So if you design the layout for one, it's just going to work on this other device, even though you had no idea about this screen resolution when you designed for it. What's more, all developers out there want units and dips. This is the easiest way that they can code all the layouts. Here's an example, I think, from the YouTube application from a Google app, where you can see we're using dips everywhere to size you know, how much space things should take out, the paddings, the margins, the text sizes, and so on, all in these kind of like um, abstracted units. So that's thinking about size in dips. And the other thing I told you to think about um, is density. And the only time you want to think about that is when you have bitmap assets. So when you um, supply an icon, for example, it needs to be, you know, when you're in Photoshop or whatever you use to create your um, bitmap assets, you need to be a certain size. Um, so this is where you have to think about density. So if you have an icon which is going to take up 32 by 32 dips, for example, um, then you want to provide different um, sized assets so that they show, um, so they stay crisp, so they don't get, you know, you're not blowing up an asset and it gets all blurry and horrible. So this is the only time you want to think about density is when you're doing bitmap assets. So if you think about the two orthogonally, um, you, your life's going to be much easier. <laughs> So yeah, that's the takeaway message. Oh, think about size and density separately. The opacity is not coming out on the projector, but the slides will be available for your downloading pleasure later on. Um, so yeah, think about density for asset crisp crispness, and think about size for layout, and you'll be happy. Yeah, so an example of this is um, how it can future-proof you. So on the left, we have a high-density phone. Um, and then in the middle, we have like a, a large kind of medium-density tablet. So if you designed, if you provided assets for the phone and you'd done a layout for the tablet, you know, at some later date, 
a new device comes out that you'd never even thought or considered, and it has you know the same density as the phone, the same size as the tablet, and it just works because you've thought about these two things orthogonally. You don't have to think about what devices are coming in the future. It's going to pick up the right assets and layouts for you. And this brings me on to the topic of responsive design. So I think Android's learned a lot from, from kind of web-inspired um, layouts, things like liquid layouts and so on. Um, and they get you so far. Having things scale, taking up proportional amounts of the screen get you so far. But I think as the web world has, has learned, um, the answer to this kind of plethora of form factors out there really is to really embrace the variety and respond to it. So yeah, a lot of people look at this landscape and they think, Ah, how do I deal with all this stuff? Um, so the responsive design approach has taught us to think about breakpoints, think about step changes where the, you know, your layouts break <laughs> and where you need to change to a different representation. So you might do something like this. You might say, organize devices into kind of like small, medium, and large, and have different layouts that work for those different size screens. And the cool thing is that Android gives you tools to do this. It's embraced this in its kind of very foundations. So here we look, I've used these little crazy looking identifiers at the bottom um, to divide these buckets up. So if you have a look at one of those, so SW600DP, so DP again, for those paying attention, is the DIP unit. Um, what that little um, kind of phrase says is um, the smallest width that this layout is going to work on is if there's 600 dp. So you can use this as a boundary. Um, if the device has 400 dps of width, um, then you know, it'll use a different layout. If it has 600, then it's going to pick a different layout. So using these boundary points, you can construct different layouts, um, and the device will just pick the right one depending on how big or small it is. I've also listed out there's a bunch of different um, what we call resource qualifiers, which you can use to create these boundary points. So you can have a different layout in landscape or portrait, or depending if it's a different height or if it's a TV rather than a phone and so on. So yeah, Android gives you the flexibility to do this. So to walk you through a simple example of how you might do that, if you want to do this kind of like um, master detail view, this is an example app that my team made somehow like meat news or bacon news, which I don't know if it went down that well when I presented this in Israel, the bacon news reader. Anyway, carrying on. Uh, so say you want to do this master detail. So on a phone, you have these two screens. On a tablet, you have them both at once. So easy on Android. Basically, you just define one activity um, for the home. An activity is a screen, basically. And then on the tablet, there's that SW qualifier guy that I talked about. Um, by defining, saying it, when there's at least 720 dips of width, then use this alternative layout. And this alternative layout will just put them both together, rather than just showing one at a time. So you can keep it dry, you can de be declarative about it. Um, very, very easy to handle these different scenarios. So the th next thing I'll encourage you to do is, when thinking about these breakpoints, is to um, start with your content. Quite a lot of people will get caught up in saying, I'm going to design my tablet layout now. And they'll say, OK, so a tablet is this big, therefore I need to design this layout. Uh, what the problem with that approach is, is if someone comes out with a slightly smaller device, or you know, something in between what you've thought about, then you're stuck. You know, you have to end up tweaking these things all the time. I'd encourage you instead, when you're thinking about these breakpoints, is to start with your content, your, you know, uh, what's in the application, um, and then work out how much space that needs. So, say you could have, um, you know, that example there. I could lay it out either as two separate screens or as a, a dual column layout. I would work more, uh, start with the content and work out how much space I need for a dual column layout, and then set that breakpoint based on the content, not based on, oh, I've got a tablet, I want a dual column a tablet, and a tablet is this big. Doing that means you'll be happy in the future when new devices come up and pop up in, in between that you hadn't thought about. If you size it to your content, you'll be happy. There we go, that's what I said. So a few quick examples of doing good responsive design on Android. Um, show a couple from the Google Suite. So this is the Google Play Music application. As you can see, you know, um, as we go through larger devices, it really easily just rearranges the same content. So things get bigger or uh, get restacked next to each other. So this is like using those breakpoints to say, oh, I need at least so many pixels of width or dips of width in order to do this kind of like you know horizontal layout. Otherwise, if it's smaller, go into this kind of vertical layout. Within items as well, if you see here this row of cards, you see um, we're changing how much cropped, how many cards are shown, how much information is shown us on each one. Very, very simple stuff. Just by using these same breakpoints I talked about, you can just optimize um, the content to respond to the amount of space available. So again, uh, simple stuff. So here's the calendar application. Um, sometimes 
this hasn't come out particularly well on the projector, but basically we just introduced margins where you get over a certain point. If you didn't do something, if you just let the content stretch all the way across, it will be a pretty uncomfortable um, experience. So you can do some really, really simple stuff to make your application just so much, so much easier to use for your users. Okay, setting maximum whips. Pocket does a great job. So it changes up from a list to a grid to a stagger grid as you get more slope space. Again, very easy to do. And Etsy did a fantastic job with this stagger grid, which they've open sourced. So I've put a link to that if you're interested. Cool. So that was a million miles an hour through thinking about the screen, outside the screen. And for the second kind of topic I want to focus on is thinking about outside the app. And so this is kind of really embracing like what you can do with Android to make an amazing immersive experience that's kind of different to like a, your, the web or something. And to illustrate that, I'm going to take you through just a quick video of a journey on my home screen. So here I am, I'm on my home screen, well, on my device, and I can already see content, there's already widgets and so on. Um, this is like the home screen on my phone. If you're not an Android user, like, this might look strange to you, but like, uh, Android users can customize and show widgets and um, have a huge amount of like, personalization. So here I decided to just um, move a widget. This is like my, my web bookmarks, move it up to the top. And I decided to carry on a search, which I'd saved to my bookmarks, which is pubs in London. So there you are. Uh, so I click that. And if you notice something interesting there, so I clicked on a map and an app opened. So uh, some people think URLs don't open apps, but on Android they can. So here I am. So now in a map, like not in the web browsers, I have this full multi-touch gestural 3D building type experience. And I can find a pub I was looking for. And I decided I want to share that with someone. So I could either use the built-in sharing or just decide to really lightweight there. I just use the keys to take a screenshot. And there it is. You can see it gives me a little notification saying, hey, there's a screenshot just saved for you. And if I swipe down from the top, I get the list of notifications. I can quickly, uh, I don't need those emails. And I can quickly use a simple gesture to expand out that screenshot I just took. Hit share. And I want to share this with my friends. I'm going to use Google Plus and blah, blah, blah. So I can, Google Plus pops up a little dialogue and I can type in a quick message and hit share. So that was a really simple kind of interaction. But I think the most important and interesting thing about that is never once did I launch an app, per se. I didn't go to the home screen of tiles and click into a tile and you know, do something and then create a screenshot and then go into home and then go into another app and then pull in that screenshot and then share it. The whole thing was just one continuous flow based on what I was wanting to do. So I like to think about this. A lot of people say the word open and op you know, Android is open and that has a lot of meaning depending how you take it. I like to think of Android being open as it's open for making more interesting applications. And I like to think of that as like a, a task-based flow. So rather than being an app-based flow where everyone's going into your app and then back home and out and then into another app and there's these little silos of data that never talk to each other, Android lets you build these incredible flows that work together. So I went between the home screen, the Maps application, the Google Plus application seamlessly. I wasn't thinking about which application I was using. I was thinking about the task I was trying to achieve. You know, find a pub, share it to a friend. Um, and you can build these kind of like seamless experiences really easily on Android. The other thing I think is really interesting about Android is it's open for innovation, which should be interesting for you guys. Because at any point, you can replace the default way of doing something. So what I mean is Android you know, has a built-in text messaging app or dialer, but if you have a cool idea about replacing that, you can replace that. And you can like, you know, plug into these different task flows that people are trying to do. It's incredibly open and flexible, and it's all like, available to you. So I'm going to get a bit more technical now and talk about intents. So intents are the glue that make this all possible. So, yeah, as I said, the, the glue between application components. Um, and what's interesting is they allow you to do this thing I, I like to refer to as outsourcing tasks to other apps. So to walk you through what that means, so uh, to break it down, intent is basically a combination of um, an action and a piece of data. So view this URL or edit this contact. Uh, and what's more is they can result in a, a return piece of data. So when you write an application, you can tell the phone, uh, these are the intents which I, I know how to handle. So for example, if I wanted to share a piece of text, like I love Game of Thrones, um, every single app on the system which says, hey, I know how to share a piece of text will appear um, in that share box. So like when I shared that image um, from Maps, the uh, options that popped up were every app I had installed on the phone which said, hey, I know how to share an image. 
So by using the system to kind of be this bus to kind of like outsource these tasks, you can like plug in your app into other people's flows. So to talk to you a few more examples of how uh, this works. So say you have an application, and in your app you want to scan barcodes for some reason uh, to kind of uh, link the real and virtual world, but um, you don't actually want to have to build a barcode scanning application yourself. Instead, what you can do is you can just um, start an intent saying, uh, there's a well-known intent out there for, um, an, with an action of scanning barcodes, so you just invoke that. And the system will say, hey, I, you have this app installed, uh, which knows how to do that. It'll launch that other application, it'll perform the task, read a barcode, and then it returns it back to you. So you outsource that task to another application. Or you can write an application and offer an API almost, so saying these are the intents that I support, and other people can invoke you. Another example is picking a contact. You know, you might want to pick a contact from the address book, but you don't want to have to write all that code to do it. The contacts book, or you know, your address book on your phone already knows how to do picking contact type stuff. So you just fire off an intent saying, hey, does anyone know how to like, pick me a contact? The contacts app says, yep, I can do that for you. Picks a contact, returns it back to you. You didn't have to write any code for that. It's great. <coughs> And another example, and um, this is how the Maps example worked early on, is that your app can declare, uh, it can handle certain kind of um, URL schemas, as it were. So when I clicked on that picture of a map and it opened in the Maps application, that's because the Maps app had said, hey, any URL which looks like maps.google.com slash whatever, give that to me, I know how to handle that. And the user can pick, like, you know, do you want to use the browser or do you want to use this Maps app, and you can set a default and all that good stuff. Um, but this is really powerful. So this means if you, in your marketing, you know, you want to send out like a URL to um, your service, um, and you don't want to have to have like a special thing, like if you have the app installed, then click here, or otherwise click here. You can just send out, a, you know, a normal restful URL, and if they don't have the app installed, fine, whatever, it goes off to the browser. If they do have the app installed, you get into this richer experience. It lets you build these kind of really like great experiences for the users. And the last thing I want to talk about is. Um, on this kind of thing outside the app is notifications. So notifications are an incredibly powerful thing, I think, and they've always been very rich on Android. So you can um, have these like large style notifications, I like to call them. So you either have like a standard one or these. I'm going to take you through some of the more powerful ones. So we have these different standard layouts where you can have either larger amounts of text, show an image in there, um, have a completely custom layout. So there's an example of a music player which you can control completely without having to go into the application. You can just do pause, play, um, fast forward and so on. And I think almost more interesting, you can have these actions. So you saw when I shared that screenshot earlier, I just went to the notification, hit share straight from there. I didn't have to go into the application. I just used the notification as a shortcut. And what this does is it lets, kind of lets you get your app out of the way. You don't have to launch the application. You can offer some functionality and complete it very, very quickly. Say you're you know, a ticketing app or something. You could say, new ticket for this band you like. Just hit buy straight away from the, from the notification. Like Having these actual notifications is incredibly powerful. It's also one of these, with great power comes great responsibility. People are getting a bit spammed out by some notifications. So here's some guidelines about um, when, to, when is a good time to show a notification. So if it's time sensitive, your calendar starting your calendar appointments in 10 minutes, or another person, like you have a WhatsApp from your wife, um, or if you specifically request it. These are good examples of times to show a notification. If in doubt, probably err on the side of caution because you don't want to um, spam your users, or be smart about it. Like you know, show a notification and track whether they responded to it. If the user didn't respond, then perhaps back off your strategy. Or if they did respond and they're liking it, maybe ramp it up. Be a bit smart about it. And it always has this um, notion of priority as well. So you can say that an incoming call is much more like high priority than there's traffic on your route home or something like that. So. If you indicate the priority to Android of your notification, then it'll use that to kind of rank them. So we'll give you the most priority ones higher, and we'll also display them slightly differently. So if you interestingly use this one, this minimum priority, what we call like an opportunistic notification, uh, then we won't even show an icon at the top of the phone. But if you go into the notification tray, then we'll show it there. It's kind of an interesting thing. So use this kind of smartly. Um, let's get that on. And so you might have seen the Android Wear announcement. I think this is an example of the power of those actionable notifications. The Android Wear kind of platform is built entirely on the uh, notifications API. So these things that show up notification on your phone, they have actions and they come out as you know, quickly actionable things on your, on your wrist. So if you think about it, you can build an application very easy. It shows a notification. It's going to show up on my wrist. And I can quickly action it saying, tickets have just come out for a band I want. Buy it. Done. Like, very, very powerful stuff. 
Um, so I want to finish up just giving you a few examples which I think really embody this thinking outside the app principle I'm talking about, uh, building applications which kind of like work with other people and you don't even think about them. So SwiftKey, hopefully you know, is an awesome keyboard. You know, only possible on Android that you can replace one of these system components. Because Android is open, you can just completely say, yeah, there's a keyboard that comes with it, but here's a, a one that I think is better. AV8, which I think Twitter just bought right recently, um, is a home screen replacement. So it smartly um, recommends apps to you based on where you are and what time of day and what apps might be relevant to you there. Uh, again, only possible because you can completely replace a component on Android. Has anyone heard of this link bubble? It's quite cool. This is a, um, a browser which came out quite recently, which lets you do kind of like tab browsing, as it were. So here I am in my Twitter stream, and I'm clicking on just standard links. And instead of kind of like popping up and being one app at a time, they just open up in these little bubbles, letting me carry on. So when I'm on my train commute in, which has no signal through Wimbledon, I can just keep on opening up all the links in the Twitter feed, and they open in like tabs, as it were. And then I can just, and when they're loaded, I can just read them when I want. Really, really cool, and this is all because of this like intent-based system that it can do all of this. And the last one, I think that's oh no, there's one more. Bolt again is a pretty innovative dialer, so it replaces your standard dialer. But if the, your friend's using Bolt, then it'll use VoIP rather than PSTN, so you get free calling to them, and it's just really, really smart. Uh, again, only possible because you can replace a system component and do all this good stuff. And lastly, one of my favorite apps from my colleagues is called Musai, which is a, a wallpaper application. It will you know, um, show you a wallpaper, uh, a different wallpaper a day. But one of the cool things about it is it offers a plug-in API so that um, different applications can supply different images which you can set as your wallpaper. Again, because of this inter-app communication stuff, um, this is really, really cool. You can just in install this, and then other applications can offer up sources. So if you have like a Flickr application installed, it could offer you photos from Flickr to show up in your wallpaper because of this inter-app stuff. So there's just a few quick examples to inspire you of stuff that you can build on Android. I'm going to end up the talk with a couple of plugs. <laughs> First off, if you remember one URL from this talk, go to developer, or just D, to save you a few keystrokes, to android.com slash design. And this will give you all of our UX patterns and so on. Uh, it's a really, really awesome site. My favorite thing about it is it's quite small. So you can actually read the whole thing in about an hour um, and really kind of like get going on Android design. If you're interested in designing for Android, um, I do a sort of monthly now um, YouTube show, about half an hour show, called Android Design in Action, um, where we talk about different um, Android design topics. Check it out. Um, and that's me. And this is this talk. So um, I think they're going to be distributed later. But if you want to get it now, you can. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nick. And now I'd like to welcome Stephen Gray um, to the stage to continue.